um, Reverend Leo Woodbury is the pastor of Kingdom Living Temple, executive director of New Alpha Community Development Corporation in Florence, South Carolina, and a member of the South Carolina Environmental Justice Network. He became involved in environmental work in the 1990s with the South Carolina Department of Health and Environmental Control around the issue of mercury emissions and advisories. Reverend Woodbury also worked with a host of other organizations, including the Southern Organizing Committee, the Deep South Center for Environmental Justice, the Environmental Justice Resource Center at Clark Atlanta University, the Southeast Climate Network, and Green Faith, among many others. Reverend Woodbury attended Francis Marion University and the University of South Carolina. He retired from AT&T after 20 years of service and received three vice presidential corporate awards. The South Carolina State Senate also presented him with an award in recognition of his community service. Cody Nordy Norred. Prior to serving as Georgia Interfaith Power and Light's Interim Executive Director, Cody worked as Gipple's Director of Programs and Policy for three years. Cody leads all policy program and outreach efforts, spending much of his spring at the Capitol during the legislative session. He also directs Gipple's flagship programs, PowerWise, SolarWise, and WaterWise, bringing sustainable and energy alternatives to communities of faith while managing Gipple's Green Team Registry, Green Team Coaching Program, and the development and implementation of all Gipple educational programs. Cody holds a BA in Religion from Sanford University and a Master of Divinity from Candler School of Theology at Emory with concentrations in justice, peace building, and conflict transformation, theology, and ethics, as well as a graduate certificate in human rights. Cody is interested in working at the intersection of religion, human rights, public policy, and environment. Shatha Reddy Alonzo. Since 2015, Shatha has served as executive director of Creation Justice Ministries, an ecumenical Christian organization that convenes and represents dozens of major Christian denominations and uh, communions in the United States. Creation Justice Ministries' mission is to educate, equip, and mobilize people of faith to protect, restore, and more rightly share God's creation. Shatha is listed among the 2018 Grist 50 Fixers and is the recipient of the National Council of Churches USA J. Irwin Miller Award for Excellence in Ecumenical Le Leadership. Brooks Barrett. Before becoming the United Church of Christ Minister for Environmental Justice in 2015, Reverend Barrett served for eight years as the pastor of First Congregational UCC in Vancouver, Washington. While there, he became active in two environmental campaigns that were ultimately successful, transitioning the state of Washington away from its only coal plant and preventing the establishment of the largest marine oil terminal in the country in Vancouver. During his time as pastor, Barrett published his first book, Sounding the Trumpet, How Churches Can Answer God's Call to Justice. It was co-authored with the Reverend Dr. J. Alfred Smith, Sr., a prophetic pastor at Allen Temple Baptist Church in Oakland, California. <clears throat> Scholar Cornell West described the book as a masterpiece full of deep spiritual truth. Barrett's second book is Cathedral on Fire, a church handbook for the climate crisis. About the book, the Reverend Dr. Gerald Durley declared, it shares what I feel is missing in the environmental movement, which is hope at the gut level. As the Minister for Environmental Justice, Barrett lead the, led the way in issuing the UCC's 2020 report entitled Breath to the People, Sacred Air and Toxic Pollution, which identifies 100 of the nation's super polluters, along with economic and racial disparities found in surrounding communities. got everybody covered. I think I have this dubious honor because I serve as the board chair of People's Justice Council. I stepped away from Gipple about 10, 11 weeks ago. Things seem to be moving along quite robustly um, as evidenced by these connections continuing uh, in this important work. I've been a clean energy activist for decades, and I can say for certain that the work and the activism has been rooted in my own Christian faith and the commitment to pursuing God's justice for all. Today, we are taking this conversation about energy justice a little deeper and thinking 
uh, succinctly, hopefully, and comprehensively about how and why congregations, local churches, and other houses of worship can and should be engaged in per the pursuit of energy justice, why it matters, and how we can further develop it as a shared community value in this extractive economy upon which everything is based right now. There are winners and losers, and there are sadly a very small number of winners and too many losers. That is not the ethic or the teachings of any of our sacred traditions, I don't believe. Um, and I think it's important that we have this congregate or this conversation as faith leaders. We support one another as we uh, um, pursue this conversation and find meaningful solutions that address the problem of injustice as it relates to the extractive economy and especially as it relates to how we power our lives. So today I hope in the various speakers conversations and remarks that we'll hear more about why you think energy justice is important, particularly in the Southeast. Why is this something we need to be addressing now? Why have we ignored it for a while? Or why have we struggled and maybe even stumbled over our own selves in trying to address this problem? Why is the faith community so necessary in this fight for energy justice today? I'd like to start with Reverend Woodbury and I'm um, hoping Reverend Woodbury, you'll share some about your own work of faith-based environmental activism, how you see congregations you're working with across the South uh, engage in this work and what's been most important in your learning. Okay, thank, thank you so much for that kind introduction and for the privilege and honor of being here in the and the company of so many great organizers and faith leaders. Uh, I, I want to start off, uh, I also want to thank special shout out to Reverend uh, Michael Malcolm and the UCC Church and others. I, I want to start off out by talking about the fact that we all know the problem. We hear the problem over and over again. We know that what the planet is going through what communities are going through is rooted in environmental and economic injustice. We know particularly in the Southeast that the Southeast is the poorest region in the country, that we have more polluters than any other region in the country, and that we are currently experiencing more climate crisis impacts than any other region in the country. We have, uh, we have snow, we have extreme cold, we have extreme heat, we have tornadoes, we have hurricanes, we have flooding, we have sea level rise. We have pretty much everything except for glacier melts. So how did we get to this place? We know, first of all, it, it began because we fail to care for the least among us, which is a commandment that exists in every faith tradition, including the Christian uh, church. And we also know that 84% of the people, according to a Pew research study, 84% of the people on this planet describe themselves as people of faith. So it has been the lack of engagement from the faith community that has allowed the exploitation and oppression and poisoning of communities and this planet to happen. You know, we like to look at the other side, but from my faith tradition, I remember the words, if my people, talking about the deity, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then will I heal the land, then will they hear from heaven. And another, another piece of scripture I like, Proverbs 27 and 17 says, iron sharpens iron and human beings sharpen the face of another. And so once we become enlightened, once we know what the problem is, it's up to us to do what we are supposed to do as stewards of the earth. And I don't wanna belabor that, that point because we've talked about it so often. We know the needs. We know we need to do energy efficiency. We know we need to do uh, um, weatherization. We know that we need 
to be doing um, uh, more renewable energy uh, throughout our communities. So why aren't we doing it, particularly at this particular time in world history? What we at Kingdom Living Temple, a new Alpha Community Development Corporation, like to call the new era of the iron will, because that is what it's going to take. We can no longer wait for political will. We can no longer wait for legislative will. We can no longer wait for corporate will to turn in the direction that will both save our communities, create opportunities, create opportunities for economic development. Uh, we must instead turn to our own will. And faith communities know about this because we operate on faith because we see the intangible, we hear the inaudible. That's how we created universities. That's how we created uh, churches and missions and ministries and all of those things because we saw beyond the boundaries and the obstacles. I say that we have an, entered an era of the iron will, but because all around this planet, all around this planet, people are moving towards implementation. So whether we're talking about the Paris Agreement, the European Union Green New Deal, the Green New Deal we're trying to do nationally here, the um, renewable energy portfolios regionally with Reggie states or individual states or cities deciding they want to become 100% renewable, we too need to be part of this iron will that sharpens the faces of our community. And why do we call it Iron Will? Because we're talking about implementing in a resolute, original, and in novel ways, which means that communities like the ones we work in that may not be able to afford solarizing their own homes may need demand side management tools, weatherization, a few panels may be on their house so that they can take offline those things that consume the most energy. We're talking about things like using new technology so that we can deal with solar powers, help our farmers that are struggling, help communities that are challenged because they don't have clean water. That's what we have to do, but it's up to us. We need to stop waiting for macro solutions from entities and individuals who could not care less about our communities, our congregations and our constituencies because they continue to put profits over people. But instead, we need to have a stronger resolve. We need to steal ourselves. We need to take a firm stand, realizing that the winds of change have already blown and whether or not they will be tornadoes or, or tsunamis or whether or not they will be the fertile and productive winds of change that will create new economies, new communities, and a new planet is up to us. Do we have the will? Do we have the strength? We've done it before throughout the millennial. We can do it again. It's time for the era of the iron will. Thank you. Thank you for that inspiring opener. I wonder if you could speak just for a moment about how this message is resonating with people in the pews just you know sp specific personal experience you've seen or things happening within your own congregation how how are people in the pews inspired to engage in a in a historical time when many feel overwhelmed by the pressures of daily life is this something that can be tackled because some days it does feel like a david and goliath how do you address that and how do you think this is being received even by those in the pews? Well, you know, we have to meet people where they are first, and we have to clearly understand that people support the things that are beneficial to them in tangible and immediate ways. And so that might be as simple as telling people things as um, when they should um, do their laundry. You know, they should do it not during peak times when they pay the most, it, it's about educating people about coming together so that we can make a difference in our community. So for example, in February, after many years, 
we were able to bring about 40 people from various um, churches to our city council and have them pass a resolution to make the city of Florence a renewable energy city. And more than that, some of us who were there supporting that resolution, which passed by the way unanimously, we are now a part of the consulting team that will be writing the energy plan for the city of Florence says comprehensive 10 year comprehensive plan. So we have 10 years in which we will actually be working um, with our congregations, the people who were there and who supported the resolution to bring clean renewable energy and lower energy costs to members of the community. So you start where people are and you take them uh, with their leadership and their input to where they need to be. And it sounds like in that instance too, that possibly it helps when people do see the fruits of their labor and it keeps them engaged and excited about this opportunity because speaking about or pursuing this justice is, can be so nebulous and hard to concretize, but it sounds like you are able to do that in Florence and other surrounding communities. Thank you, Reverend Woodbury. Cody Norin, my friend, fellow colleague. I recognize that office over there. Not much has changed. Well, a lot has changed. You're leading it now, and you are the right leader for the job these days. Uh, speak some about how we connect this to the work of the local congregation and um, why that is important in this work. And also, um, what has been your experience of uh, working within the energy space and pursuing equity and justice on behalf of all of God's people? Yeah, thanks. Thanks to everybody on the panel and thanks uh, Reverend Malcolm for having me. Uh, I think, you know, just to build off of what Reverend Woodbury said, I think uh, how do we inspire people to take action at the local level to see particular solutions right where they are? You know, how do those solutions then put pressure on these larger systemic injustices to push the needle. So how can individual congregational actions push that? And I like to talk about it in terms of energy efficiency um, because that's a lot of the work that we do here. And energy efficiency isn't one of the things that we think about as the most attractive solution all the time. People always wanna jump straight to solar. Um, but I've said a lot that you know, when we move into our congregations to turn the lights on or uh, turn the sound system on to proclaim a message of hope and uh, our religious convictions that we kill our neighbors faster because of the way that we produce energy in our states. That's just the reality. Um, then that waste from the energy that we produce goes into communities and it continues to kill them. I think just last night we had a virtual hearing for the coal ash pond closures at Plant Share down in, in middle Georgia and to hear over and over and over these communities who are being poisoned by the utility uh, in some cases, the utility that they work for. Um, and so how do, we, how do we connect these systems between our, our individual actions to these sort of state level and uh, utility level decisions? And I think, uh, I think Reverend Woodbury is right, that we, uh, we have the potential as people of faith to take action when no one else will take action. The amount of land, the amount of buildings, the amount of individual households that we have allow us and afford us the opportunity to be moral leaders in this space. And we can change, we can do energy efficiency, we can do solar, and then we can use those as examples to push on policies so that the state has to take that into accordance, so that utilities have to pay attention to that, and so that we can educate people about how our individual actions actually have huge impacts on the way that we love and care for our neighbors. Um, I think that energy issues in general, especially across the Southeast are intentionally complex uh, so that people can't understand how their individual choices affect everybody else and play into these larger systems. So I think the things that we can do is we can educate ourselves, we can take action at the local levels and we can actually reclaim the power and our prophetic voice in the public square to speak on behalf of our neighbors, to help provide them with the resources that they need for a better life and to use our platform so that we can speak into these policy spheres to get something more just on the table for everybody. Can you speak to an experience where a green team you worked with previously really connected the dots on this work of uh, pursuing energy equity and energy justice, um, or you know how they 
miss the boat even, you know, so we can name the obstacles that we are up against some days in this work. Yeah, I think there, there are two pieces to that. So there are several congregations, I mean, within Metro Atlanta, but, but across Georgia who have gotten on board with this because they begin to understand we have to make the connections personal and how do these connections between energy and our calling to love God and serve neighbor, how are they connected? And I think once people get that, uh, you know, one of the things that's hardest for congregations, I think, is that the solutions that we have on the table require us to do something new and require us to do something creative. Uh, and that is not always the thing that we embrace as congregations. However, it's really clear that what we are doing isn't working. And so once we reclaim the idea that our calling actually to love God and love people requires us to be creative, that's the only thing that we have. Um, we'll never have more money than utilities. We'll never have more power than politicians. But what we do have is a calling to be creative and a calling to live into these commitments to be to be moral leaders. And so I think once people understand that it is not only morally beneficial to do things like energy efficiency and solar, though it might be different and creative, it is also financially beneficial, even though those models might look differently. It is almost always financially beneficial. Um, and then the other piece is, is connecting that again, like I said, to how it affects people. So we've talked a little bit about the waste of power generation, so coal ash or something like that. Um, but also, as you know, energy equity and energy burden is a big deal. You know, the average energy burden, uh, so that's the amount of after-tax income that a household pays for their energy, is about 3%. But in Southwest Atlanta or the city of Atlanta proper, we have households that are paying 10 or 11% of their after-tax income just on electricity, so not including gas and transportation. Um, and so really what this means is that we have to pay it, we should be concerned about how much people are paying for their bills. We spend a lot of time as congregations doing relief work for disasters or combating homelessness or providing shelter for immigrants or worrying about refugees, which are all great things. But what that also means is that we should be really concerned about people who can't afford to turn on the heat in the winter or the air in the summer, and that we have, we have the ability and the power to do something about the structures to allow those people to afford to live a life. Sadly, I imagine those numbers are going to be higher when someone does the analysis during this COVID time as more people are at home and we're finding strapped financially, not just because of job loss, but because of maintaining a home with so many people under one roof and in the South, keeping it cool during one of the hottest summers on record. So I, I'll look to that data to come out. Hopefully someone's going to be pulling that together in the next 12 months. We can really see yet another impact that COVID-19 has had. There, um, This is all um, connected. There's intersections everywhere we turn with this work on energy justice. And Shanta, you've been at the heart of this work for a while. You've seen the evolution from just talking about creation care to environmental justice. And now we're seeing more people speak openly about energy justice and equity. Share some more about your work through Creation Justice Ministry and what you've, uh, have, how you've seen this evolution as an activist and committed to this work for so long. Yeah, thank you. Um, so first, I want to say thank you to the United Church of Christ for just consist consistently shining a light on environmental racism and environmental justice issues. When I think about the arc of this um, story, the UCC has played a pivotal role uh, in, in bringing us to where we are today. And also thank you to the People's Justice Council and Alabama IPL and the Southeast Faith Leaders Network for advancing energy justice, bringing this conversation to the fore, uh, along with the resilience work that we're all doing together in the Southeast. Um, I am coming to this conversation as a national ecumenical partner um, to many ministries that are involved in this summit. And together we're moving out of an extractive paradigm that puts unjust burdens on people who are living in poverty, um, burdens that perpetuate racism. And faith communities, as has been articulated um, from a bird's eye view or a national view, um, they, they play a key role in disaster response. And we have seen um, the Southeast just getting hit over and over again. Um, and then the, um, you know, in terms of the extreme weather events, um, we're also, you know, seeing another set of disasters with the pandemic. Uh, so the economic disaster in our midst um, is requiring us to collect mutual aid. 
And um, as a faith community, we are trying to get ahead of disaster as much as we can and not just be reacting to it. So we can and must build resilient infrastructure that can withstand extreme and dangerous weather that we know is only going to become more frequent. Um, so yes, weatherization, community energy co-ops, smarter grids, being strategic about how and when we use energy in our households, these are all tools that we have. Um, in the most immediate term, what Creation Justice Ministries is um, lately focused on is about um, their pandemic response. And that means saying no to utility shutoffs in the midst of this crisis. Uh, it means upholding our moral responsibility to ensure that broadband access is accessible for every child and young person who needs it for their education. This is about education equity. When we think about energy equity, they are so connected. Um, so we have been working on um, the COVID response at the federal level um, uh, and really the energy justice issues are just central. Um, doing energy justice in the Southeast um, is also important to um, us as a national ecumenical partner because I would argue more than any other place in the country, faith communities are a core part of the social, economic, and ecological fabric of the local communities. Um, our congregations are just pillars and cor cornerstones um, of, of communities in the Southeast. And that is why I'm really um, just so encouraged by this witness here uh, and by the work of our, our partners on this um, summit today. Thank you. Um, have you seen have you seen a difference in the way even the supporters and and partners within Creation Justice Ministry are engaging with energy justice and the pursuit of equity in this in this realm? Um, yes, I would say that uh, leaders like Reverend Malcolm are definitely um, pushing the envelope and getting people to think differently about these issues. And I would also say because of the pandemic, um, people have really shifted their attention uh, to understanding how energy justice um, is is core. Um, so this conversation is just coming to light in a new way as we're facing the possibility, the, you know, the utility shutoffs that unfortunately in some communities um, is commonplace. Now more and more people are experiencing this um, phenomenon and um, need to demand justice. Uh, and then the, um, the question of like uh, weatherization, the extreme weather that we're seeing um, this year more so than previous years, it's just bringing it to the fore in a new way. Um, so I do believe this conversation is cutting edge. Yeah, I'm, I appreciate you bringing up the issue of utility shutoffs because that's a great place to connect the dots for people, uh, for lay people especially in thinking about how um, we use energy and, and power our homes and businesses um, is connected to so many other matters and protecting our most vulnerable neighbors from having their utility shut off because what we see in the social service sector is that just is, becomes a snowball effect. Once you have that happen, slowly other services erode and you're left uh, in a really dire situation. For, uh, and families are impacted every day by this. So if we can advocate on behalf of our most vulnerable neighbors right now during this pandemic, it's to advocate for no utility shutoffs and to continue to pursue that and be aware of that as houses of worship as we seek to serve these neighbors during these trying times. Thank you, Shanta. Reverend Brooks, it's great to see you today too. I appreciate always your witness in this space. I would love for you to share with our audience the work that you are engaged in and how you see environmental justice informing or even providing the foundation for this work we're now doing specifically around energy justice for the South. Hey, thank you so much, uh, Kate and uh, Michael and all of the panelists I have the pleasure of being with. I'm reminded of uh, the famous French uh, Catholic priest, Father Pierre, who once said that we need to see with two eyes open, one eye to see uh, the immense beauty of the world, to give thanks to it, and, get, and one eye to see the injustices of the world to, to fight against them. And uh, to look at this panel and to look at this, this conference as a whole gives me lots to give thanks for. There's lots of beauty uh, and the organizing and energy that's gone on to this. So thank you so much. Uh, it fills my heart with gratitude to be with all of you. 
Um, and to to answer your question, Kate, I think environmental justice is uh, so important to, to this conversation. I think there's a number of gifts that uh, faith communities bring to the energy justice movement. And I think one of them is this uh, moral squint that we can bring. Um, it's a moral squint that uh, allowed Ben Chavis to look at what was going on with toxic waste dumping in the 1980s and describe that as environmental racism. And it's a moral squint that allows us to see the unjust economic burdens that are placed upon people uh, as they are paying their bills and struggling to pay those bills. Um, and so all of these things are part of what environmental justice looks like. And I think there's so many different angles we can take. And, and sometimes I think it calls upon us to, to bring in some angles that uh, that may be difficult to hear at first. Um, and, and one angle I'll just mention here is, you know, we, we can look at energy justice issues as we should uh, from a consumer point of view. Um, the, but the, another yeah, angle is the, um, it, it has to do with the, the commodity background to the, these, uh, to the energy that we consume. Um, and, and to bring a moral squint to that, uh, there have been people have described that we sometimes put a green halo on things like solar. But if you look at the supply chain for what produces solar, well, you'll see that coal is sometimes used. You'll see that there's a chemical industry involved and it's the same chemicals that uh, Aaron Brockovich fought against. All those things are used in the production of, of solar. And sometimes to mention those things, it's like you show up at a party and, and you've uh, brought in dog poop on your shoe, right? And, but I think it's important that as people of faith, we bring a moral squint even to those issues that, that sometimes people don't want to hear about, um, you know, and bring a moral squint to the factory floor uh, where solar and wind are being produced, uh, are the workers being paid a just wage? Are they being paid a family wage, right? And so all of that isn't to kind of to, to bring uh, dog poop into the broom, but really is to use our imaginations and say, hey, this is a moment in which we can really reimagine our society and what it can be become. This is an opportunity for us to live out more justly. And in order to do that, we have to have that moral squint, first of all, uh, to be asking the right questions. And so, so I think that's part of what the environmental justice movement brings to the table. Can you share more about how your own denomination with the UCC is engaging in this work even beyond the South and equipping people to really engage from their particular context? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, a lot of it is really focusing on churches realizing the gifts that they have to bring. You know, the UCC, we're very proud of our church, uh, our local churches, that's where the power resides, right? And, and it's at the local church level where one finds tremendous gifts. Um, and uh, one of the gifts is that, you know, we're, we're a pre-organized community. You don't have to go around knocking on people's doors to get to know people and then find out what their needs are. you you should, you know, we interact uh, every Sunday, even if it's virtually, right? And so uh, that's in the church world, that is. And so I think, you know, we come and, and we've, we're blessed with this community that is faith rooted. We're rooted in what sustains us and drives us and energizes us. And I'm uh, reminded of uh, uh, when I was uh, going for a walk in Atlanta, uh, your neck of the woods, there's a little uh, poll that says, has a saying on it uh, that I saw when I was going for a walk. It said, when I becomes a we, even illness becomes wellness. And I think that's what we bring as faith communities. We bring a community and, and a community where we know how to deal with things like grief. We know how to deal with and, and how to accompany people through this process so that we come out the other end. And so so I really, you know, I think it's shining the light on the tremendous power that churches can bring to it when we get organized, when we get focused, and when we bring that moral squint to the table. I think you highlight an important point about what faith communities bring to this work is that um, this element of addressing the grief, but also uh, 
participating in an act of confession or seeking forgiveness for the ways that we've been complicit through the years. And yet we're hopeful about our capacity for change for a higher power or God and for my terms to, you know, to, to change me, help me see with new eyes and go through the corporate practice of forgiveness as we move towards that creativity that Cody highlighted that we are communities of creativity as well and can play a unique role in finding sustainable solutions to our energy burden here in the South. Uh, or and across the, the country and we, we begin to lead on that. Um, I appreciate your acknowledging that faith communities are essentially natural networks for in order to educate as well as to advocate. Uh, and I and we should not step back from the opportunity as faith leaders ensconced in various sizes and locations of faith communities in addressing this important issue. It's not something that people are, might hear in other places unless they're dialed into a workshop like this. Um, it's not normal daily conversation in a lot of circles. People think energy just happens and they don't consider the consequences or the costs, even recognizing that they have power themselves to change the system we currently find ourselves in. What we're acknowledging today is that we can change that. We can advocate for cleaner energy that does not burden our neighbors and uh, also ensures that future generations, future disciples even thrive because of our energy choices now and the way we choose to act and protect our neighbors as well as creation. Reverend Michael, are there any questions you're fielding right now that you can see that we need to address from this panel? Thank you, Kate. Glad you asked. I did have a few of them here. Energy efficiency retrofitting has the potential to create millions of living wage jobs, ideally union jobs. How can we create just transition programs to create these jobs in the process of transitioning off of fossil fuels? Cody, I think you are well equipped for that question. That, that's the reason I asked it. And maybe say why, why you have some experience with a little bit of this, given your work with the PSC. Sure. So um, in Georgia, we have a public service commission that is the elected body that regulates our utility, our monopoly utility, Georgia Power. And so through intervening with that body and having conversations with them is how we get to the point where we enact systemic change around things like energy efficiency, like extra renewable energy on the grid, et cetera. I mean, I think this is, this is the important part where individual actions rub up against systemic change is that we can do a lot of stuff without interacting with systems. But at the end of the day, if we really wanna have these, these turnovers, I mean, what we're talking about here is a just transition. So moving people from perhaps polluting systems over to a renewable or efficiency system where they have good jobs, good benefits, that their jobs do not put them at health risks, um, and that we as communities can receive those benefits. The only way to do that is to engage in these systems to require it to become policy. That is when our, our faith communities and our individual actions have to intersect with these political processes so that we can intervene so that we can demonstrate that these are values that faith communities have and that there's a better way to do things. And so we have to pressure things like the PSC or like our state governments or even start more locally on city council levels or county commission levels. There are cities that are passing these 100% clean energy plans or have these energy efficiency benchmarks. And there's an opportunity there to require that those services are constructed in a way that those are given out to particular contractors that are going to do that work well, that have this just transition mindset. So I think there are a bunch of different ways that we can look at it, but ultimately what it comes down to is uh, intersecting with systems. We have to get it in systems and policies or else it won't happen. That's right. Thank you. Another question. Uh, this is actually for Brooks. It says, please expound upon the opportunity we are faced with re reinventing our society.
Yeah, I, I think uh, that's an excellent question. I think, you know, one way to think about it is that one of the gifts that we bring also is the gift of imagination. And, uh, you know, in, in hearing about this, I'm, I'm reminded of how Martin Luther King Jr. brought his imagination to the parable of the Good Samaritan. He had been to Jericho Road. He saw how dangerous and it was and that it was uh, structured to, to be dangerous, right? Uh, that it, it was ripe for ambushes and, and robbers. And so ultimately, you have to transform the whole Jericho Road. And I think that's similarly here. Uh, you know, we, there are people that uh, literally die when their, their electricity is cut off, right? And how, and at a point you have to ask ourselves, we have to move beyond just assistance uh, measures to transforming the whole, the whole system. And, and I think right now we're in a fortunate period of time in that uh, a lot of young activists have given us a vehicle for informing that process and that vehicle is called the Green New Deal. Uh, it's really the only legislative proposal on the table that has the scale and magnitude equal to the crisis that we face today. Uh, it's something that still needs input. It's still being shaped and formed and it needs the input of pe the people that are at this conference. Um, I, you know, and, and with that said, I think if people want to look at details of people who have really thought through these issues, I would start first and foremost with uh, looking at the great materials that Jackie Patterson puts out at the NAACP. Uh, start with uh, uh, something called lights out in the cold. It's about this issue. It's about how people literally die, you know, from, from the, having their electricity cut off. And it's about, so, you know, solutions that are micro and macro. And so check that out. And it give, if you want to kind of get into the policy weeds, uh, it's, it's a great place to begin. Thank you. Last question. Um, I believe that the better individual congregations can see the in, environmental risk they, they face. The more they will be able to empathize with the broader interfaith church body. Question Do you feel like your particular congregation sees environmental risk in just political terms or also in personal exposure terms? And I guess that can be for anyone with we'll popcorn that one. Is the question speaking to how our engagement with environmental issues or energy justice is politicized as opposed to our personal commitment to pursuing what is right? It, it, see, it appears to be that way. Whether, whether it's political or if, if it's a moral issue. And well, you, I guess he was asking in your personal congregation, and Reverend Whitberry, as a pastor, you definitely want to answer that one. Well, I was going to say it in our church, it's it's, it's a moral and spiritual uh, commitment. We see this as uh, what we often call the first commandment, when God tells us to be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth, the original recycling program. And so we look at that and, and our neighbors. Uh, and so, you know, I mean, when you join Kingdom Living Temple, you know you're going to be involved in environmental and community work and, and outreach in, in that way. And how does it benefit individuals? And so, um, for example, when we work with uh, Duke Energy to construct the Whitney M. Slater um, Community Solar Farm, one of the things that we insisted upon um, was that we that Duke did not replicate engines of economic and environmental uh, injustice because it doesn't matter if a home is powered by solar or if it's powered by coal. If that home is energy inefficient, people are going to heat and cool the outdoors and pay a disproportionate amount of their income on energy costs. And so because of that, we were able to get them to do free energy efficiency for 1,500 homes that would be eligible to um, 
to become a part of that, uh, to get their energy from the community solar farm. So for us, it's, it's, it's a moral commitment, it's, it's a spiritual commitment, and it's a commitment, as, as I said before, that we have not only to the environment and the planet, but also to care for, for our neighbors and the least among us. And that's what we preach and that's what we teach. And um, as you know, Reverend Malcolm, that when, when we go out in the community, whether it's to advocate or direct action or to meet with policymakers, we often have our congregants with us.